Good afternoon. My name is Nick Fuller, and I am the Chief Ecological Officer at Natural Communities LLC. So we are a native seed, plant, tree, and shrub nursery, but more importantly, we also have a lot of experience with ecological restoration and design and implementation, building ecosystems that can withstand today's challenging conditions, stormwater surges, climate change, invasive species, healthy ecosystems that can substantially reduce our dependence upon herbicide. So if you can picture a Venn diagram of where native plant materials and ecological design and ecosystem management intersect, where all of those things come together, that is the backbone of our framework called flywheel ecology. And that is how natural communities bring nature to life. I've been in the, working in the ecological industry now for some time, and honestly, I love it. And I'm sure a lot of other folks in here love it as well. Working outside, always a different challenge, doing something different every single day. The changing of the seasons, saving nature, it's pretty awesome. But I'm pretty certain nobody got into the ecological restoration industry to apply herbicides. You got into the ecological restoration industry to frolic with the mythical creatures, to flutter with the flutterflies, and to buzz with the bees. But if your path was like mine, you quickly found out that herbicide application was a major portion of the industry. And that may not jive with your tree hugger sensibilities, but we are all here today to, treat, to try to improve and to try to do better. Am I right? So today I will teach you our four step framework called flywheel ecology. Today we are gonna focus on the strategy of flywheel ecology. And you may recognize many of the tactics in this presentation, but you may not have seen them all strung together in a comprehensive strategy. These individual tactics may not be revolutionary in and of themselves, but the revolution comes from the systematic way that you go about using this framework, that once you grasp the flywheel ecology mindset, your goals will come into such clear focus that once you see clearly beyond these one-off tactics, you can actually see many, many years into the future, even decades. Let's go to the other side where the grass is truly greener. Let's take a look at these two trajectories of standard ecological restoration in red with flywheel ecology in green. So on the x-axis, we have time sense restoration. You can see that the standard restoration route of incremental grain gains, but the problem with this route is that you have not built up enough momentum in your ecosystem so that when you step away for a year or two, your invasive species reseed and populations explode. You're forced to herbicide with a very heavy hand due to the large invasive species patches. We're talking Greek canary grass, Phragmites, honeysuckle, whatever the invasive species are, they explode once again, taking advantage of that void, that disturbance that you just left, and the site actually becomes worse. In this continual boom and bust cycle, honestly, it's a downward spiral. You feel like you can't keep up. You feel like you're on a never ending treadmill. You feel deflated like you just can't win. On the other hand, this is versus flywheel ecology. Flywheel ecology is investing in your future. And many people see this investing as a frivolous waste of money. But I can assure you that flywheel ecology is supremely beneficial in the long run. It's cheaper in the long run. It's going to save you substantial amounts of time and substantial amounts of herbicide. You do need to recognize that with flywheel ecology, there are upfront sacrifices, but those sacrifices will lead to exponential growth that you are seeking. Also recognize that you will have doubts up front. Is this working? But And you're gonna become impatient, but time and patience is the key to exponential gains in the future with flywheel ecology. You might even say, Nick, I can't afford to do this. But I would say you can't afford to not implement flywheel ecology because you will be setting yourself up for failure if you don't. So I want you to think of this in another way. So let's take this chart and we're gonna flip it upside down. 
So I've changed the y-axis to required maintenance in effort and time. The x-axis is the same, it's time since restoration. So you can see that flywheel ecology will take more effort up front. No doubt it will. But this in few short years, you will have way less effort to maintain your ecosystem resilience. Less effort means less time spent battling invasives. Think of this time as your extra profit. Now, the real question is, what are you gonna do with that extra time? And I know what you all are thinking. It's vacation time, but we got work to do. So how did we get to flywheel ecology? Well, I've spent nearly two decades in ecological restoration, from woods to wetlands to prairies to rivers. And with all of these projects, I've had some great successes working on threatened and invasive species, I'm sorry, threatened and endangered species, rare and remnant ecosystems, miles upon miles of river and stream restorations, some seriously challenging stuff. And on these projects, I was able to spend very long durations of time maintaining these projects and observing their trajectory. And I'm not talking about trajectory over just three to five years, but I'm talking over decades and even multiples of decades. And I can tell you which approach fared significantly better. And along the way, I've learned a lot from some giants in the industry. First, I worked for a well-respected ecological contractor and a pioneer in the industry. Pizzo and Associates, uh, Jack Pizzo, who um, is a pioneer, and I learned from him the foundation of ecological restoration and vegetation management. Second, I worked for a land management agency, managing large tracts of lands. We're talking tens of thousands of acres for long periods of time. And there I have had the pleasure of working with plant ecologist Scott Coble, who taught me land use history, and database trajectory of our natural areas in the Chicago region and the Midwest. Scott Coble, who in turn learned that from his predecessor, Wayne Lampa, another well-respected botanist in the Chicago area. And I've learned a ton of landscape scale restoration techniques from Herman Jensen, a restoration ecologist, a giant in his own right. I've also picked the brains of some of the most well-respected land managers in the entire Midwest along the way, stealing some of their best tips and tricks. Forest preserve land managers, federal land managers, land trusts, state forests, some of the best and the elite in the industry. And I've also had the pleasure of working with and project managing some of the, uh, many of the ecological contractors in the Midwest as well. And across the board, I've learned their best tips and tricks for success in natural areas. Uh, last but not least, I've worked with Ryan Anderson from the Integrated Pest Management Institute of North America, and he helped me push my limits of where integrated pest management go, could go for natural areas management. So now these land management agencies that I worked for and worked with, they have some pretty sizable chunks of land. Again, tens of thousands uh, of acres. But as we all know, restoration is severely underfunded. So we need to we need it to be better. We need it to be more efficient, more strategic about every single dollar that we had and every single staff allocation their time. So we had to figure out ways to do that. So in addition to ecological giants, I also looked at outsider knowledge for some basic principles that could be applied within the ecological restoration industry. Principles in industries that have a significantly longer track record than ecological restoration. So I've researched efficiencies and effectiveness principles, systems principles, some excruciatingly boring stuff, I'm telling you, but don't worry, I read them so you don't have to. Although there are some really good books that do stick out, um, and I got some of those uh, displayed here. So we've got Good to Great by Jim Collins which is where the initial flywheel principle comes from. And this is a business book. The Four Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss, Don't Do More, Do Less. Doing Less lets you focus on the important. Books like Work the System by Sam Carpenter teaches you how to develop systems and stick with them. Books like Clockwork by Mike Michalowicz teach you how to get your systems automated. So when you develop focus and you distill it down to the essential principles, 
then you develop a great system around that focus and you work that system to give it momentum, you have hit a world of magic and that is our goal today. So the person who grasps principles can successfully select their own methods. This person who tries methods while ignoring principles is sure to have trouble. Ralph Waldo Emerson. Strategy without tactics is the slowest route to victory. Tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. And zoo. So these great quotes inextricably tie together strategy and tactics. You need both, but you need to develop a strategy first and then execute day-to-day -day tactics to meet that long-term strategy. Flywheel ecology is the strategy. So tactics are the individual steps or the immediate actions that we take on a day-to-day -day basis. So you could be great at controlling honeysuckle, this is a tactic. But if your ecosystem is not resilient and it's not healthy after you've killed that invasive, what has that tactic gotten you? Really, it's gotten you nothing, except you just hose the ground with a bunch of herbicide for really no reason at all. Are you really better off or did you just waste time and resources and unneeded environmental consequences due to applying these herbicides? Do you need a strategy to look beyond the initial control tactic to build resilient ecosystems? So as opposed to tactics, strategy is the fundamental the truth that serves as a foundation for a system or a chain or reasoning. So we're going to use principle and strategy interchangeably today for, uh, for today's presentation. And I would say that many approach restoration as a series of tactics or methods, uh, not tied to a longer term, stitched into a longer term strategy. And if you lean too heavily on tactics, you will miss the forest for the trees. So let's dive deeper into tactics versus strategy in restoration. So tactics, how do we kill reed canary grass? We use X herbicide at X rate and you will get X kill rate versus strategy. Why are we doing these tactics? What is our ultimate goal? Well, we're killing reed canary grass because we'll be implementing a multi-year strategy that through a very specific suite of native plants and seed planted in very specific locations with very specific timing and through a well-oiled and quite disciplined management regimen in concert with evaluations and we tweak our tactics through time with adaptive management and over years we're going to build a resilient ecosystem so what is the flywheel ecology strategy well when i first <clears throat> started ecological restoration i learned invasive species seems intuitive right invasive species are the problem so let's start there but once you learn them, you can't unsee invasive species. I'm pretty sure everybody's experienced. You see them everywhere. And it makes you upset seeing them. Seeing them over and over and over again it ingrains this pest first mindset in your brain. And because of this conditioning, my mind always went to controlling invasive species first. And this seems to be the case across the industry as well. If you like sports, Think of this analogy, a lot of practitioners have a great tactical defensive game, killing invasive species, but they have no offensive strategy, building resilient ecosystems. There is no linking of multiple tactics together to achieve this long-term strategy. Integration pet, pest, uh, IPM, Integrated Pest Management, is a tactic. It's a great tactic, but it's just that. Flywheel ecology is a fundamental principle and it's a long-term strategy. Flywheel ecology is most benefits, not least impacts. Flywheel ecology thoughts and actions are led by building resilient ecosystems, not just killing individual pests. Flywheel ecology is three-dimensional. It's holistic in its approach to building resilient ecosystems. Flywheel ecology is a discipline, not unlike martial arts, in that it is a lifelong pursuit, continuous curiosity, site improvement and self-improvement. Myself, I'm continuing to learn more and more about this each and every day, and it is very interesting. So can you see the difference? When you shift your mindset 
from least impacts to most benefits, you'll approach the ecological restoration world with a whole new lens. So speaking of principles, who has heard of Vilfredo Pareto? So he has made several important contributions to the world of economics. Uh, one of these, uh, most important to our talk today, is called the Pareto Principle, also known as the 80-20 Rule. So Pareto noticed that 20% of the population in Italy had 80% of the wealth. Pareto noticed that the same ratio applied across many, many subjects that he noticed. One notable time, he noticed that 20% of his pea plants produced 80% of the peas. That uh, this is the example that had caught my ear because obviously I'm interested in plants and this is what bridged the two, um, the financial world and ecological restoration world for me. So if you're wanting to maximize productivity, you would want to focus on that 20% productive techniques that are producing 80% of the results. So if you're able to provide, provide focus, you need to first stop doing the unproductive 80% of your efforts. And if you stop doing the unproductive 80% of your work and you continually use that freed up time that you have and you reinvest that back into the 20% of your gains, your work will be unstoppable. So over my 20 years, I've taken this ecological knowledge and I've combined it with this outsider knowledge and I've tested and I've retested again and again. And I've had some pretty epic fails. I've had some tests gone astray. You can just ask anybody that I've worked with. I'm sure that they will tell you about my quirks in detail. And I've done it long enough, hopefully now, to do it better. Is it perfect? No. Am I perfect? No. But you just have to continually keep expanding this uh, basic principle and you'll be moving in the right direction. So I've done it wrong enough to do it better. And so you can take advantage of my numerous failures so you don't have to repeat my mistakes you now have a shortcut to success. And I will tell you, um, again, I don't have all the answers, uh, but this will at least point you in the right direction. So to design your projects with more native plants, to be specific with those native plants and to roll those plantings out over time. But before I learned all those good things, I had my earlier career and I definitely made some mistakes, some that I truly regret. My first career out of college, uh, just graduated, I worked for an aquatic weed management company. And when I first started, I thought it was so cool. I was like, I'm gonna be a water scientist. <laughs> but it quickly became apparent that I was not a water scientist and I was aquatic herbiciding machine. My role was solely based on killing vegetation around detention basins so that people had a perfectly manicured lake. At the time, you weren't, these weren't even lakes. They were actually wetlands and I was killing off vegetation that was native vegetation. In turn, that led to harming wildlife and their habitat. So this job not only was applying herbicides, but in its actions, it had no intention of moving away from herbicide use. It was not in their economic interest to do so. In this job, two things changed my career path forever. Number one, I recognized that I was harming, not helping ecology, and that was the opposite of what I was trying to accomplish with my career and my life. Number two um, was I was applying herbicide and having the hose come loose and having that concentrated herbicide spray all over my groin area. And if you're in the herbicide industry and you have a pesticide license, you know that this is the worst place to be exposed to herbicide. I had some acute symptoms from this herbicide exposure, and I am not really into that, and I'm sure none of you are either. Uh, and I reflected on these two instances, and then I put in my notice to quit because it is not my life's goal to kill nature and be exposed to herbicide. So I'm gonna ask you some self-reflection questions. And if you don't ask the, answer them as well as you would like, hey, it's okay, we are all here to do better. I can't answer these questions perfectly myself. Um, we're just here today to try to learn how to reduce herbicide and how to make uh, our planet that much better. So Self-reflection. Is the only time that you talk about integrated pest management 
is that when you're taking the pesticide exam every three years, have you never considered herbicide use in um, any of your projects in doing better? You might say, Nick, I have an integrated pest management program. I herbicide the least that I can. You might even say, Nick, I'm using natives. That's good enough, right? But if you're looking at weed treatments in a robotic mechanized way, without a lot of thought beyond this one-off individual treatment, me see weed, kill it, initiate IPM, load herbicide, pew, pew, integrated pest management complete. I'm sorry about that. But uh, if you think about it that robotically, you might technically have a one-dimensional integrated pest management program, but you definitely do not have flywheel ecology. So ask yourself, can I do better? Or with every herbicide application, do you have a preconceived plan with specific identified steps, steps that have done consistently over time, they allow you to move away from herbicide use, a plan that if implemented consistently with discipline, uh, you are practically guaranteed success. A plan in which you spend more time planting and seeding as opposed to herbiciding. A plan that aligns with your green mentalities. So finally, my four step strategy called flywheel ecology. We have planning, planting, maintenance, and evaluation. So you're probably saying, wait a gosh darn minute, Nick. This is integrated pest management. I learned this every three years with my pesticide training. And honestly, this part does rely heavily on integrated pest management. But I will get you light years beyond integrated pest management later on in the presentation. Before we get into the planning for the future phase of using this framework, we first need to look and understand the past. So hopefully you read your presentation materials and you brought your flux capacitors. So get that puppy out. Let's fire it up. We're going to take a journey back to the 1600s. So now, to get you into that mindset, close your eyes. Imagine standing exactly where you are. But imagine standing here in 1600 AD. So swipe away the computer, swipe away the desk, and swipe away the buildings. Visualize prairie flowers popping up all around you. So look into the distance. There are seas of prairie and wetland all around you. In the middle ground is a dotted oak savanna, and then that grades down to an oak woodland adjacent to a river. So in the 1600s, the natural areas were largely intact over the entire landscape. So not to say that before European settlement, humans had no impact on the landscape. On the contrary, this land was a human cultivated landscape for sure. Native Americans were here and they had a very sophisticated land management practice to curate the land to their liking and to nature's benefit. Their largest impact to the landscape was implementation of intentionally human set fires. This annual burning was implemented at such a large scale that during the fires, you could see burning from horizon to horizon. Native American practices are quite important because they fully shaped the landscape for the better. Their management created an incredibly diverse, fire-dependent natural community, but a natural community that was dependent upon human set fire. So in the wake of these clearing fires, they also curated the landscape by planting, by seeding, by coppicing to create rich food plots and forests for both themselves, but also for the wildlife that they were hunting. So rolling hills with wildflowers growing everywhere, it must have been magnificent. So since I can only imagine what beauty it had, I will let Ellen Bigelow, an early settler, speak about Illinois, the prairie state, in 1835. Nothing can equal the surpassing beauty of the rounded swells and the sunny hollows, the brilliant greens of the grass, the numberless varieties and the splendid hues of multitudes of flowers gazed in admiration too strong for words. 
So unfortunately, after European settlers arrived, they kicked Native Americans off of their land, stealing it and ramping up settlement dramatically throughout the 1700s, the 1800s, and 1900s, changing things dramatically negative in a negative way for our natural areas. Native American lands were taken along with the wholesale change of their land stewardship practices and the land ethic that they had. Adding insult to industry in 1837, we had the invention of the plow expediting the destruction of our prairie. And uh, did you know that Illinois is called the prairie state? And this is quite amazing because in Illinois, the prairie state, we have lost 99.99% of the original remnant prairies in Illinois. We've lost 80% of our wetlands, period. And of the ones that are left, they're not very good. And that is mind boggling. So for our woodlands, also huge swaths were clear cut by European settlers to make plank roads and structures once they arrive. And we've lost over 80% of our oak woodlands. So take a look at this map. The gray was pre-settlement oak woodlands. The blue is 2010. You can barely even make out the blue. You have to squint really hard. So if you've lost 99% of the prairie, 80% of our wetlands and 80% of our oak woodlands, what is the single most important thing that you can do? We need to create resilient native ecosystems because they're just completely missing. Okay, so we're done with our past. We uh, if I have to fire up that flux capacitor one more time. And now we're gonna be going back to the future, back to our current time to discuss further threats. So obviously things have fundamentally changed in a very short time. We've lost the land ethic that Native Americans had, that connection to the land, to respect it and to live within its means, that we as humans are dependent upon nature for our food and for our water. We're very disconnected. And that our shelter is dependent upon a stable climate. And that we should be fostering the land for the better and not be treating it as a commodity. We've also lost many millions of acres of natural areas. And not only that, but these prairies and woodlands that remain, they're smaller, so small that we call them postage stamps. And if you add fragmentation, loss of poor habitat, loss of wildlife, it looks pretty bleak. We've lost our natural processes like fire, making the remaining natural areas less healthy. Rain doesn't soak into our prairies anymore, and it flows off of the buildings and roads directly into our streams and in our rivers, and we're depleting our aquifers for dr precious drinking water. And with all of it, it is carrying pollutants. We also now have a global economy, and we have more and more invasive species each, each and every year. Weather patterns are more intense. And all of these things are compounding themselves to lead to a more and more ecological instability. And all of this is horrible for humans and the planet. Whoa, this is heavy. And at this point, you're probably saying, what is this guy talking about? He's putting up Back to the Future memes and he hasn't even talked about flywheel ecology. I showed you all of this because I needed you to make sure or at least be reminded that you knew where our lands came from, where we're at now, so that we can decide where we want to go into the future. It's obvious in Illinois that we have to rebuild ecosystems from the ground up. So let's start with the foundation of planning. So in this planning step, we are trying to understand the current state of your particular natural area. Um, then we're going to plan to build the foundation to move forward with your restoration in a planned way. So we're going to ident identify what communities you have at this moment in time, and those are the current communities. So this is a very broad brush stroke at the site to group like areas or like issues together so that we can make a plan for the next steps. So this is a project I worked on recently. So we're gonna use this as an example. So first question, do we have any existing natural areas? And of that subset, 
do you have any remnant natural areas? And if you do have those remnant natural areas, those are the first and foremost to protect. You might be saying, Nick, what is a remnant? Think of a remnant as an ancient thousands of year old ecosystem that contains vast riches of ecological wisdom and resources that have accumulated over time. So some might call this an old growth forest, but in the Midwest, we also have old growth prairie and old growth wetlands here. These areas can have substantial old growth characteristics intact, otherwise known as a remnant. Here in our particular project, we do have old growth oak woodlands. Those areas are identified in green, and those appear to have a pretty intact native oak overstory uh, community. Uh, also our herbaceous, the, the flora on the ground woodland floor is also relatively intact, so we have a relatively healthy there. Um, but they have been greatly suppressed due to invasive species. And again, this is a great ecological resource that we want to preserve first and foremost. So the next question is, do you have any existing native planting, such as a prairie recreation that you want to preserve? In this case, we do. That's identified in yellow. So do we have any post-European settlement communities? So again, you may be asking yourself, what is a post-European settlement community? Sometimes we call this second growth. So this is a community that has developed post-European settlement, so after European settlers arrived, and a lot of these times these communities are less than 50 years old. The reason why is they typically have developed in old ag fields or completely disturbed uh, footprints, and so they have not yet had that time to develop into an ecological masterpiece. So on the natural areas value spectrum, they have significantly less natural resource value than, say, a remnant would have. So we also have um, here, again, where we have unassociated second growth. That's, that's one of the specific post-European settlement communities, um, which is a mishmash of woody species, native woody species, non-native woody species that have popped up over the last 50 years in an old ag field that was taken out of production. And those areas are identified in red. So this does not appear to be remnant and nor does it appear to have a very good native herbaceous layer intact. So uh, do we have any blank slates? So what does that mean? Um, this basically means, do we have any old ag fields that were taken out of production recently? And we do, that area is identified in brown. Uh, do we have any monoculture areas full of invasive species or non-native species that need to be addressed before planting? Oftentimes we do, uh, in this particular case, we don't, but if you do have those areas, examples could be reed canary grass, Phragmites, and so on and so on. And you want to address those invasive species first before planting. So how do I know if I have a remnant or if it's recreated or if it's lacking any remnant properties? And how do I know the land use history? That is where we have the 1939 aerial topography. And I like to think of these as the magic 1939 aerial because it's like a looking glass into the past. It's magical because it's like a time machine traveling back in time that allows us to look at land use history. What, when I look at these, what I first see is the uh, dark gray, the darkest gray splotches on here. And those dark gray splotches are good things. What are they? Well, typically they're remnant oak woodlands. Since these were here in 1939, they are typically remnant because largely second growth forests were not here yet. And so it kind of lets you know that these are old growth forests. What do I see second? Well, I see a patchwork or a quilt work of agricultural fields, and those are indicated by light and kind of the medium gray. Typically, these are squared off on natural areas, uh, so those should be apparent to you on here. Where is our site on this particular map? It's right there in red. So let's take let's zoom in a bit more to take a closer look. So now look at those woodlands on this particular map. And so can you see the difference here? So if you look on the left hand side of your screen, you can see a very open oak savanna. And in this oak savanna, you can actually pick out individual trees. Imagine how much light would have been streaming down to the ground floor in that oak savanna. 
Um, also, you can see a very dense forest in 1939 towards the bottom of your stream, screen. And the reason why this is dense is because it was sheltered from fire because it was located next to a stream. So even in this uh, forest, the deepest, darkest, shady areas in 1939, you can see, you can still see the ground in there. And I can still in certain sections pick out individual trees and I can see the grounds. So there still would have been a lot of light streaming into the woodland floor. So now let's compare those side by side. And do you notice anything about the density of the historic savanna in the 1939 aerial uh, versus today? So in today, it's very difficult to pick out individual trees. It's really a forest. You have trees touching each other. And that's because the forest has filled in the gaps from lack of prescribed fire. And it's choking out the valuable oak woodland to death. So why did so many trees grow between 1939 and today? Well, again, fire was largely stopped on the landscape in between 1600 and 1800s because Native Americans were kicked off of their land and so went their land stewardship practices, the human set fire. And Europeans largely grazed these woodlands because they could not row crop them easily. And so this grazing really uh, kept the woodland open. That is until the meat industry collapsed collapsed in and around Chicago areas in the 1940s. And then once that happened, they pulled off of that grazing pressure. And then all the brush that had been um, kept at bay first by fire, then by grazing was allowed to explode because nothing was keeping it in balance. So these trees that have grown up since 1939 have now created great amounts of shade in our savanna and in our woodlands, shading out the entire woodland floor the wildflowers and the grasses. Um, this woody growth, native and non-native, is our largest threat to our oak woodland communities because now no light is getting down to the woodland floor. And these, uh, these wildflowers and grasses are disappearing. And we have massive issues with white oak regeneration. And if we don't have white oak regeneration on these 250-year-old parent trees, we will not have the next generation for oak woodlands, and we will have an entire ecosystem blink out right before our eyes. So we're not going to get into this too much, but these are soil maps. They hold secrets as well. So if you have hydric soils, probably going to be wetlands. If you have woodland soils, probably best as a woodland. Prairie soils, best to restore those probably as a prairie. So these can help out, help map out prairies and wetland communities in particular because of the the old um, ag field um, because they largely would follow the historic soils that were there as well. And if you're trying to restore hydrology, say you're disabling drain tiles, these can help to some extent predict post-restoration hydrology. So we now know our pre-settlement communities. We now know the current state of our remnant communities, and we now know the current state of any modern day communities, for example, the ag field, the second growth woodlands, the prairie recreations, et cetera. So now we need to identify the threats that each community has, and then we need to mitigate those threats. So if you are in the Midwest, a handy guide to identifying those threats and really just a treasure trove of information uh, is the Chicago Wilderness Biodiversity Recovery Plan. So if you see the link, the QR code at the bottom of your screen here, you can get this free publication. So it identifies nearly all plant community types in the Chicago area. And really, this works for the greater Midwest as well. Um, and then it identifies the most common threats specific to those communities. And this is an excellent launching point for those who may need help in identifying communities and their associated threats. And these threats usually line up with the community type. So here uh, we have a few threats on this site. We discussed them a little bit before. We have our oak woodlands. So we're going to identify the threat. So that's the area in green. We have invasive species. We have honeysuckle, a bunch of other invasive woody stuff. We also have overstocked native trees like wild black cherry. Basically, we don't have enough light hitting the ground in the woodland floor to sustain our ancient ecosystem. So we have to identify a mitigating action. So it's mow or clear those invasive and overstocked uh, invasive trees and the overstocked native trees. So in our second growth forest in red, 
We have to remove invasive, again, invasive woody species and overstocked trees to create a significantly more open woodland, an open woodland that has enough light streaming in to sustain a native herbaceous layer, basically wildflowers and grasses, a native layer that will support controlled burning. Agricultural field, um, that's the area in brown. So we're gonna have to identify the threat there. Uh, so we have agricultural drain tiles in here. So we probably need to break those drain tiles to restore hydrology. Another threat is we have no native plant community at all to speak of. And so we need to augment that with native plants. So the overriding threat to our natural communities, like I mentioned, is the lack of native plants. And then number two, is a lack of native plants that will sustain fire. So always having the mindset of designing these communities to be burnable, both in the light re regime and also your species selection. So a core question is, do I have enough light to sustain adequate fuels to carry fire? If not, your project will likely fail if it is of any scale and you cannot manage large fire dependent ecosystems without fire. So as I said before, many times in the Chicago area, we are looking at a ground up ecosystem recreation because we simply don't have a native plant community. Number two, we're getting into now, this is the planting step. So we have to plant the native plants back. In some cases, you may have a remnant community to coax back to life, although planting can even, even be a powerful tool to help coax those remnant communities back to life as well. So to plant these native communities back, we first need to know what our community is. And to do this, we need to know our soil moisture and our light regime. So soil moisture, um, on the left-hand side of your screen here, we're gonna start off with dry. Most folks overestimate what dry is. I've got a cactus growing here, which is native, it's prickly pear native to Illinois and much of the Midwest here, that is dry. We're talking like really dry. So don't think uh, uh, your yard is probably dry because it's probably not. Uh, next step down the hill here, we've got some turf grass growing because I think this is a great reference for people. If you can grow turf grass on it, you're probably somewhere in the normal soil moisture uh, segment. So again, it does skew from dry, you know, for turf grass all the way down to wet for turf grass. There is a, a, a natural uh, trajectory kind of across that uh, whole hydric, um, hydro, hydrology spectrum. Um, and then as you get down to the cardinal flower in red here, let's call that uh, wet mesic. And then we have really wet and emergent. That's where the cattails are growing on the right hand side of your screen. But for your light regime, I also find out that most folks, including myself, overestimate the amount of light. So just recall, full sun is six plus hours, bare minimum, six full hours of full direct sun, all the way up to full sun, period. So think of a wide open treeless prairie, that's full sun. So part sun is kind of the next step down in terms of your light regime. We're talking four to six hours, again, full sun. We're not talking dappled light, we're talking full sun. So think of that really wide open savanna in that 1939 aerial. We're talking 50 to 75% open canopy. Shade is dappled light all day, potentially two to four hours of even direct sun. I would still call that shade. Uh, this is maybe 10 to 20% open sky. Deep shade, uh, or even I call it pitch black, which is artificial shade, anything shadier than uh, that, that oak woodland that we have is not gonna really sustain uh, in a native ecosystem very easily because that just really didn't exist very much uh, back uh, in pre-settlement um, pre times. So not much, um, so, okay, let's, let's put the soil moisture and that light regime together and let's go back to my example. So again, we have the ag field. So this time we've changed some of the colors because we're identifying communities of where we want this to go. So we have full sun, uh, in, in, in all of that ag field. So again, to subdivide that, let's take a look at that area in blue in the bottom of your screen. So that's full sun, wet soils. So this is a sedge meadow grading into possibly emergent wetland. And so we're gonna use native seed and native live plants in here. 
In the yellow area, we have full sun. We have normal soil moisture. So we have mesic short grass prairie in here, and we're going to be using seed. In the light green, this is full sun, slightly wet soils, maybe in the spring. And we're going to call this wet mesic soils. So in here, we're going to use native seed and plugs. And so in our oak woodlands, identified in green, we have enough remnant herbaceous and native woody material to recover if we manage it properly with clearing and burning, but we are going to give it a boost with some native woodland seed, uh, grass seed in particular, and some of those later season species. In our second growth woodland, the area identified in red, we have improved our lake conditions in this area dramatically. So again, we removed invasive woody species, we also removed quite a bit of nati native overstocked trees as well to increase that light dramatically because again we're trying to grow native wildflowers and grasses in here to sustain fire we're also going to want to plant oak trees in here as well to transition that to an oak woodland so now that you've identified the general communities of where you'd like to see these areas move towards now we need a little bit more we need to get a little bit more into uh, the weeds here and come up with specific species lists for each community that uh, fits the site. So the best way to do that is to reference these remnant ecosystems uh, for inspiration to help present, uh, recreate resilient and functional ecosystems today. There is a reason these systems co-evolved over thousands and thousands of years. These are these uh, ecological masterpieces that I talked about, and we want to mimic that. So botanists have been studying remnant ecosystems, and they noticed a general pattern. So if you look at the geology, the moisture, the soils, etc., in area uh, one, and then uh, you um, and you look across the landscape, and uh, you you find a similar community, they create a pattern. So if that community is in a geological spot that has the same traits mentioned recently as another geographic spot, they will also likely have the same remnant plant communities, or they could support similar plant communities. So these plants, they all tend to associate together when they have similar conditions. And in the industry, we call these plant associates. The king of plant associates in the Chicagoland is the flora of the Chicago region. Nobody would ever call this a light field book by any means, but this is an awesome resource, resource here in the around the Chicago area, but also Illinois and the greater Midwest. This thing is just fantastic, full of knowledge. So um, this is going to give you community-specific plant associates. For example, if you're looking at a white oak mesic woods and the kettle moraine underlying geology, Plant associates of that community would be oak sedge, shooting star, side flowering aster, et cetera, and it just gives you a whole list. And this is how restoration ecologists develop uh, species lists that are specific uh, for restorations on a specific site, a specific community, specific light and moisture regime, even get down to soils as well. So this is how you sow the seeds for a resilient ecosystem. So if you listen to the land, and it will give you all the knowledge that you need. So even though this step is quite important, I would say this is really overly detailed uh, for many smaller scale restoration projects. But if you're doing a large scale restoration or if you're dealing with a remnant community, you deserve to give uh, the site this much detail in the planning stage. Because again, you're building the foundation is critical. If you do not need the specificity, uh, you don't have the time to get into this amount of details uh, you, or you need help in the first steps that's fine it's really complicated i get it i just wanted to present this information so that you could at least have an appreciation for how restoration ecologists develop species lists don't worry there are cliff notes that you can use uh, you can use predetermined seed mixes. This is fine. Just make sure that you have an ecologist validate that these seed mixes are appropriate for your particular site. Okay, the seed mix. So this is the backbone of your efforts. These are going to provide the diversity and the main way to get native coverage across your site. So you pair your seed mix with live plants 
uh, because it's a great way to supplement in critical areas and for certain needs that just cannot be achieved by seed alone. So one example is, let's call it a wetland, and it's in a flooded area. So seed may wash away, so you might have to use plants. Or you may have to augment with certain sedges. Uh, they're really important to get in by live native plants because they just don't produce seed, and so they're not commercially available to purchase. And so the only way to get them into your ecological restoration is to put them in by live plants. Getting these species in the mix is critical, and you have to install them as live plants to achieve uh, the, the very critical services that they provide. Typically in the industry, these have been known as warrior sedges. It's more specifically what I'm talking about. Tom Vanderpool mentions warrior sedges in a book called Healthy Nature Handbook. These are great set for sedge meadows. So with flywheel ecology, we're gonna expand uh, what Tom's premise is, and we're just gonna call them warrior plants. And then we can expand this concept to all ecosystems, not just sedge meadows. So number one, recall, get the correct seed in place, uh, both by plant community and species. Number two, deploy plants strategically. They are great, but they can get expensive. So you want to use them properly to augment the seed in a very explicit and specific way. And you want to plan for that. Plants can be used to uh, augment diversity. They can be used in, in a multitude of different ways. But in the context of flywheel ecology, we're going to talk about planting warrior plants for building resilience in your ecosystem. So warrior plants are usually strongly rhizomatous plants. Uh, in other words, they spread through their roots very aggressively to hold the ground against invasive species. So we do not have time to get into these too much today, but we do have a list of warrior plants for various communities on our site. You can either search it or you can go onto the, uh, the menu of buy native plants and then there's sub menus under there for these various communities. Um, so the deployment of these species, like I said, can get quite expensive. So use a restoration ecologist to help guide them into the areas where they're going to provide critical value for you. So again, remembering that 80-20 rule, using 20% of your resources to gain 80% of the value. So deploy these only where you need them to meet specific requirements to stabilize disturbed areas. Deploy them only when needed after herbicide applications to fill in those dead patches. So once you have the correct seed mix and the correct plants in the correct location to build that momentum, now you want to maintain your masterpiece. So I see fire and mowing as, as many people do, as the most important management tools you have to keep your natural areas looking good. So mowing builds initial momentum in your flywheel. Mowing is to establish native plants in the early years. This is critical. It controls weedy species and allows light to get down to the ground and let those little native seedlings germinate first and then develop into mature perennial plants. In years two and three, you'll likely be spot mowing or spot brush cutting to control invasive weeds and seed production. And now in your third year plus, you hopefully have enough fuels to support a fire. And that fire depends, uh, it, it continues upon building that initial momentum. Fire encourages fire positive species and fire dependent ecosystems like most native ones. Fire helps control invasive woody species Fire removes the duff, which allows herbicide treatments to be that much more targeted and that much more effective. It can actually reduce the amount of herbicide you're using to control those invasive species. So I also have to touch here on woody invasive species control. Um, you also likely know that fire is your best tool in keeping woody invasive species in check. Uh, once you're in five years plus, woody invasive species will begin to creep back in. So in this photo here, we can see some honeysuckle creeping back in, but everything in this photo could be controlled by fire. However, let's say a couple of individuals were either too large for fire to control, or let's say they were in wet pockets and it doesn't burn consistently, uh, or it just lacked fuels or whatever. So we know that some of the invasive woody species are not going to get top killed by fire. That's basically what I'm trying to say, and that's okay. 
It happens on everybody's projects. It's going to happen. Uh, just knowing that it's going to happen, you got to have a plan for those. So with Flywheel Ecology, we're going to, again, implement that 80-20 rule. So we're going to let the fire do the heavy lifting for us first. So we're going to run a fire through there. And then once the fire is done, we're going to evaluate it. So in the spring or even better in the fall, after a fire was implemented, we wait until the invasive species are green and the native species are still dormant. This will show us extremely clearly what areas were not controlled by the fire. If we let the fire focus our efforts, our most expensive efforts, our human resources, we focus those with pinpoint accuracy only where it's needed to save substantial time and money. So besides that, it's significantly more effective, it's more efficient, it's a better use of your time, your dollars, your resources, and we're using way less herbicide and we're letting nature do it for us. And then we find those green, uncontrolled individuals, those larger individuals of invasive woody species, we cut them with a brush saw and we dab a tiny amount of herbicide on them to then control them for the next fire. And this one two punch will significantly step up your woody invasive species control game on top of building resilience in your ecosystem. Once you've considered all other management ways, uh, but they didn't work for you, you're, you're needing to move on to herbicide. And we, we all have done this. We don't really want to be doing it. Uh, but you know, this is kind of the end of everyone's, uh, not everybody's, but most folks integrated patch management journey. But it is not the end of our journey here. This is exactly where flywheel ecology comes into play. So anytime you use herbicide, you want to have a plan in place before you herbicide it to reduce your dependence upon herbicide the next go around. So a good way to change, again, your mindset around this herbicide use is to think of it as not only killing the invasive weed, but what else are you doing? Think of this herbicide application as creating a planting bed for your native species. Once you do this, that totally changes your mindset around what herbicide is for. So always be ramping up your invasive species competition while ramping down herbicide use. If you look on the right hand side of your screen here, this is sort of what I call an herbicide ramp from the most aggressive at the top to the least aggressive uh, at the bottom of the page. So we, um, so we want to start at the top of this herbicide ramp, That's typically how it goes. We have to broadcast or very, be very aggressive with spot spraying. <clears throat> and um, you want to do this only if it's necessary. You only want to do it once at the beginning to create a site-wide planting bed. Then you're moving down the ramp to spot herbicide application. And then you're going to be moving down to hand wicking. Uh, only treating individual plants, you're applying tiny bits of herbicide at that point. You're always going to miss invasive species. Again, everybody's going to miss invasive species. This is okay. Just make sure that those invasive plants do not go to seed. So follow up each of ev every single one of your herbicide applications by cutting the seed heads. For in this case, what's shown in this, uh, this photo here, it's reed canary grass seed heads before they produce viable seeds. And be militant about this. This is really critical in the whole flywheel ecology approach. Being militant and keeping your weeds from setting seeds, this is critical. Um, a stitch in time saves nine reed canary grasses. This is another application of the 80-20 rule. So um, again, herbicide with intention. Again, before your herbicide application, you should have a plan in place to fill in the gap you created by herbiciding. So post, uh, post herbicide application, after your herbicide application, put your focus into seeding and planting those controlled areas to build that resiliency. Purchase them or have them collected before you er actually herbicide. This removes the bottleneck so you can hit the ground running. Lack of preparation and discipline and consistency with this will lead to moving back up that herbicide ramp. And I've personally had it happen to myself, bad ecologist, Nick. And so when you are devising your strategy, you got to have a short-term game and a long-term game in mind. So your short-term game, Natural Communities has a native rye cover crop mix, Canada rye and Virginia rye. It's up on our website. It's fantastic. It's cheap. 
and it's to patch these planting beds you just created. It's cheap, it germinates quickly, it works in the vast majority of communities, wet, dry, partial shade, full sun, and it will uh, not give you diversity. That's not what's intended for. It will not give you long-term stability. Again, E20 rule with this is that we are trying to get the job done to fill the gap the quickest way, the cheapest way possible. So this job is patching the herbicide hole you just left. This native rye cover crop mix, it's sprinter species is what we call them. They cover the ground quickly. Sprinters run fast, but they also run out of steam fast as well. So these are short-lived perennials and they'll live for about three to five years. Then they're gonna disappear. This is actually great. Uh, so simultaneously to getting your desirable sprinter species established, you wanna have a long-term game as well. The long-term game is uh, your marathon runners. So these are your warrior plants. You want to dabble these warrior plants in each and every year, consistently building momentum in your flywheel. So don't just uh, do it once. Uh, you need to continually augment um, as a preconceived maintenance uh, plan, as part of your maintenance plan. So you may think this is too expensive, but it can be done for just a couple hundred dollars uh, per acre or even less, and it gets cheaper and cheaper each and every year. Each and every year, you're gonna be saving time and you can reinvest that time back in to be more effective on the maintenance footprint you already have, or you can actually expand your efforts onto another area. You get that first site locked down and you begin another site and you start the whole flywheel process all over again. And it has the snowball effect. So while we're on herbicide, we need to take a look at the 80-20 rule once again. So this time its application is minimum effective dose. So minimum effective dose is the smallest dose that will result in the desired outcome. This comes from the medical field in regards to dosing of medicine. So just like medicine, if properly used, herbicide can be an effective treatment in certain applications, but it is not in and of itself a solution. Do not rely on it as a solution. So when you talk about correct herbicide, you have several considerations beyond uh, being effective in killing the invasive species. Correct herbicide means just not being effective, but its choice in terms of the environment and the human applicator's health is a consideration. The correct herbicide means it will not disrupt native plant augmentation aspect of flywheel. flywheel. Again, creating that planting bed, you don't want something that's going to be a long residual and prevent you from augmenting with native species. You want to use an herbicide that will allow you to plant and build a resilient ecosystem. You want to use the least amount possible that's effective. You also want to use this medicine for the least amount of time as possible. So medicine, just like herbicides, needs to be incorporated into a holistic medical approach, not used in a vacuum in and of its own. So think of it this way. If you eat foods that are unhealthy, let's say you just eat pizza and that's your diet, and you think medicine is going to fix the medical pro the problems that you have, you are likely incorrect. Your body needs nutriment, nutriment and exercise to be healthy. Ecosystems need nutriment in terms of native plants, Plants are the basis for our ecosystem. Ecosystems need exercise as well. Think of maintenance and controlled burning to keep them in tip-top shape. Herbicide alone will not give you a healthy ecosystem, just like medicine alone will not give you a healthy body. Herbicide is just a tool in the toolbox. It's a blunt instrument, only use it when necessary. So where can you get some data for this minimum effective dose journey that you're on? Well, if you're not aware of a gentleman called Chris Evans, his research uh, is on invasive species control. If you look him up, uh, he was or possibly is a forestry extension and research specialist with the Dixon Springs Agricultural Center in Southern Illinois. His research is based on invasive plant species treatments using herbicides. And his research provides us with data narrowing down which herbicide is effective and what is the minimum effective dose of herbicide to achieve the result you're looking for. Herbicide, again, is an important tactic. Remember, it is just that. It is one tactic in our strategy. And this data that you'll be looking up is only to provide you with some sort of insights into what herbicides kill effectively. 
not, it is not fully inclusive of the full herbicide ecological principles. For example, can you plant native plants after you applied herbicide X? You have to make sure that that's part of your equation. So make sure you're running the herbicide through the full lens of minimum effective dose within the context of flywheel ecology. Okay, so now we're on to evaluation. So monitoring evaluation can be as detailed or as basic as you want. For our most basic needs in flywheel ecology, really all you need to do is walk in nature and to discover what worked and what didn't work. It's that simple, do not overthink it. Success is seeing what is working and reinvesting in those control techniques that worked, reinvesting in those native plants that worked, reinvesting in the native seed that worked, observing where it worked, and reinvesting into those specific footprints again and again, applying the 80-20 rule. So are these areas where, are there areas where natives are not establishing? Where are those areas? Why are they not establishing? Take notes so that you can address them later. And you wanna mimic the tactics and other natural areas adjacent to those that worked and get them to work on that particular footprint. I think you're starting to see the picture here, but just a hammer at home. Think of the four steps in this framework as a flywheel. Picture a huge, heavy flywheel, this massive metal disc mounted on an axle. And to get these things moving, your entire team needs to be pushing all in the same direction. You can't have one team member pulling while the other team member is pushing. At the same time, we're gonna be battling ourselves. So we can't, um, so to get everybody aligned on this process, it's critical. It's the mindset change we talked about earlier, and you need to get this through to your entire organization. And once you get your team ready, you have to heave ho, and the team pushes as hard as they can, and you get that flywheel to inch forward almost imperceptibly at first. But after much, much persistent effort, you get that flywheel to complete one entire turn. One rotation of the flywheel in flywheel ecology is one year. However, one rotation does not get you a resilient ecosystem. You have to keep pushing and the flywheel begins to move faster. And with each and every year, with continued great effort, at least up front, you move it around a second rotation your second year. So what does this look like in practice? You run the flywheel over and over and over again. The four step framework we just talked about, year one, plan, plant, maintain, evaluate. Year two, plan, plant, maintain, evaluate. Year three, year four, year five. Each flywheel spin, you distill what is working and you reinvest back into that 80-20 rule. You control invasive species using minimum effective dose. You make sure that they don't produce seed. You plant native rye cover crops and warrior plants in their place. Year after year, if you do this, I promise you will have less weeds, more natives, and a more resilient ecosystem. And eventually, the momentum of this thing kicks in your favor, hurling the flywheel forward, turn after turn after turn, its own heavy weight actually working for you. At some point, bam, you hit breakthrough and nature actually takes over and all you have to do is give that flywheel little nudges each year in terms of maintenance and control burns. So with flywheel ecology, you now know how to unleash mother nature's healing power. So this is distinctly different than letting nature do what nature does. Just like anything, you have to sow the, six, the seeds of success, the seeds of the future. The correct native plant in the correct location, with the correct human care, it will actually begin to heal the site itself. And if you know of systems concepts, this is pure automation and exponential growth. So how do we put it all together? So first comes the mindset change, and this is critical. Remember, this is organizational as well. So if you add in the flywheel, and then you add momentum to the flywheel, applying the 80-20 rule, reinvesting that compound interest back into the 20% productive best of the best planting and maintenance techniques. Give it a little bit of time and a little bit of love. Sprinkle a little bit of Mother Nature's magic in there as well for some exponential growth. And when you look at the synergistic abilities of this full stack, it is limitless. Also remember that flywheel ecology is a continual investment. It's continual and consistent discipline, 
effort over time. Swooping in once every three years to do a little bit of spot spraying is not adequate, and this does not build momentum in your ecosystem. At the same time, flywheel ecology does not need to be expensive. Trickling maintenance over time in a strategic way to build momentum in your flywheel in your ecosystem. Budgeting annually to adequately cover these minimal maintenance activities. Budgeting for plants and for seed. Strategically planning annually to implement these best practices. Building more resilience year after year equals less herbicide use year after year. And it's going to save you time. It's going to save you frustration. And that time that you save can be put into converting more turf grass or more areas into resilient and healthy ecosystems. <clears throat> and the site is better, you feel more rewarded, it has this dramatic snowball effect. So we only have time today to cover the strategy and we do not have time today to get into the details. So I'd like to finish with an offer. We would love to hear from you on the details of your particular project to help you in your flywheel journey. So we have several ways of working with clients on your questions. So number one, for a dialogue of more complex questions, we have a free flywheel ecology, a wholesale consultation that can be scheduled on the front page of our website. You can email us, please reach out with your questions. We love talking about this stuff and we are here to help. So always remember to stay curious in your restoration journey. Keep asking questions. We can always learn more. I'm here to learn more um, in my flywheel journey, and there's always ways to improve, and we can always be better about restoring our planet. So I hope you take up this flywheel ecology journey in your natural areas design and your management so that your natural areas bring nature to life. Thank you.